Hello, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the lead pastor at One Church TO, and you're listening to the teaching time from our weekend gathering. We're an imperfect community of over 70 nationalities and five generations who are attempting to follow and shine Jesus in the greater Toronto area. Our vision, it's so simple. We want to help people from all walks of life know God, love people, and in turn, impact our city for good. We've designed these weekends to be meaningful, challenging, and encouraging, and I hope that's what you get from listening. Well, we're in week three of a series called Attractive, and we've been learning over the last couple of weeks of how we can become more attractive in a world I think we'd all agree has become more combative in nature. Now, this week is an interesting area we're going to explore, and we're going to explore how to witness without making people cringe. Now, let's just start by acknowledging this idea of witnessing, especially in our present climate and culture, can feel offensive and certainly intrusive. Uh, Offensive because people have a set of beliefs, and to invade their space with our beliefs feels uh, offensive in this culture, doesn't it? And I think, too, we can all look over our shoulder and see some cringeworthy moments where maybe witnessing was over the top, maybe even caustic in nature. So, but why, so why would we even explore this? Why would we even talk about witnessing in a, in a culture right now and the climate that we're at? Well, it's because Jesus commands us to, actually. Our memory verse for this week is going to be Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Can you say that out loud with me? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Now, what's interesting is this is something that often when people come and they follow Jesus, this is one of those commands that they kind of want to leave with somebody else, right? Let the pastor do that. Let, Let this outreach do that. But this is something that you and I are to embody. So in order to do it in a way that people won't cringe, (laughs) I want to help us answer this question. This question, what if Christians became the best advertisement for Jesus? What if Christians could become the best advertisement for Jesus? I think we'd all agree, sadly, this isn't always the case, right? Uh, Author Anne Rice, uh, famous for some of her novels that she's written, uh, she wrote, and I probably shared this with you in a weekend before, it's such an insightful way of recognizing where the culture's at, where maybe Christianity is perceived and where people are at. Anne Rice wrote this, for those who care, and I understand today if you don't, I quit being a Christian, I'm out. I remain committed to Christ, uh, as always, but not to being Christian or being a part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years, I've tried. I've failed. I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. Ouch. Ouch. But it's not hard for me to understand why Anne might feel that way. Is it hard for you to understand maybe some of her reasoning around that? Why she wants Christ, but she doesn't know if she wants to be associated with the Christian movement? I, I, it's not hard to understand. Friends, we've got to do better. And we can do better. Now, how do I know we can do better? Well, there's another author, uh, you know, hundreds of years before Anne, and his name is Luke. And Luke recorded the activities of the first Christians. He records it in the book called Acts in the New Testament. And in it, he describes their activities and their reputation. One of the things he says about them is that they were loved by their neighbors. They were loved by their neighbors. Can you imagine that being said of us? That a Christian moves into your neighborhood, moves onto your street, and the value of homes go up? They're like, woo, Christian move next door. I'm not sure everybody feels that way right now. And Luke said it this way. He said that they enjoyed the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily. Added to their number daily. In other words, they were like a magnetic group of people that you couldn't push people away. They were drawn in. Now, I want to just explore this space though. 
What happened between Luke's account and Anne's account? What happened that somehow we have managed to alienate people from Christ as opposed to attract people to Christ? Well, I think all too often, one of the biggest problems is we don't look different. Followers of Jesus just don't look that different. Author Scott Saul says it this way, rather than shining, a light, sh- shining as a light to the culture, we often become products of the culture. Jesus would say that we were to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and it harkens back to a covenant God had with his people to be a people that would point to God. People would be so attracted to what they have that they would want God. But I think if we're going to be honest here, I think sometimes we're not salt and light. We, I think in turn, sometimes we end up tasting like and looking like everybody else, the world around us. And if you look through the annals of history, you see that the Christian movement has some very dark moments in it. Very dark moments. You can see great moments of violence, abuse of power, misogyny, racism, white supremacy, and all of them perpetrated in the name of Jesus. Now, there are some great moments in church history, but there's some pretty ugly ones. This week, we saw eight women of Asian descent gunned down in Atlanta, Georgia. Racially profile, uh, motivated for, by someone who claimed to be a, a Christian, a born-again Christian. Uh, friends, I think acknowledging something is really important. We should never be, feel threatened by that because our loyalty is to Jesus Christ. But I think in, in Christendom, there's been a veneer that's gone over this religion <laughs> and it's allowed a lot of toxicity to hide, a lot of brokenness, a lot of ugliness to hide underneath this veneer of religion. Listen, if you know One Church TO, we're trying to cut through the veneer and we're trying to get as close to the person of Jesus and live that out in this world. Now, I think what we want to do and what we need to be focused on is what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the great British pastor. He said this, Christians become a light to the world to the degree, can you say that? To the degree that we stand out as different from the world. Christians become a light to the world to the degree that we stand out as being different from the world. The world is not thirsty or attracted to another moral turf war. That's not what they're looking for. The world is not thirsty for a neighbor who who denies their neighbor, takes up their comfort, and follows their dreams. But the world is starving and thirsty for a neighbor who will deny himself, take up his cross, and love a weary world around him. See, friends, contrary to what the critics might say, I don't think Christianity is the problem. I think our approach is the problem. I can see it. I can see it in the rhetoric of the church at large. We've gotten out of balance with Jesus. We've got out of Jesus focused. And it's produced a rigidity around us, a holier-than-thou kind of attitude. It's produced a materialistic and secular kind of drive inside of us. So how can we, we, us, Stand out as different, as our witness, that, it's, that people don't cringe when we witness, that we become the best possible advertisement for Jesus. Well, I'm going to give you three practices or postures that you can follow that will make us more attractive and the best advertisement to Jesus wherever you live. The first one is this, be authentic, be authentic. When I got married uh, years ago, I got married in 1992, so you do the math how long that is. I married a woman who is a realist. Uh, Shelly is such a realist. Um, it's funny. She's never been shocked all the years I've known her when she the, sees the human condition. She's never been shocked when she's seen some brokenness and ugliness in the church. She's not shocked when she sees it in the world or culture. She's a realist. And one of the most attractive things about Shelly is if you've ever had the privilege of knowing her, she's quieter, so you may not know her well, but she is authentic. She's real. Uh, She lacks the ability to pose. 
She lacks the ability to pretend. I love that about her, though. I, I, you know, in fact, when we were talking through some of my messages this week, she goes, you know, I know who I am. I could give you an alphabetized list of all my faults. And I love that little lie, because she's thrown that out many times over the years. Because she, she, she won't pretend. She won't pose. And there's something incredibly attractive about that. But that realist married an idealist. <laughs> and I've learned the hard way what she always knew all along. I've learned that we all ignore, we all disobey, and we all deny Jesus more than we are willing to admit. We're a mixed bag of contradictions, friends. I mean, when you see me at my best, you can see Jesus' gentleness flowing through me. A woman emailed me two weeks ago and just said, everyone knows you're approachable. You, you know, and I just thought, oh, well, that, that's got to be Jesus inside of me because people could approach Jesus. He was approachable. I, you know, when I'm at my best, you can see Jesus' love flowing through me, his joy flowing through me. But friends, I'm not always at my best. And some people have seen my impatience flowing through me, my, my, my take no prisoners drivenness inside of me, my cutting, cutting directness that I can have about me. At my best, uh, you know, I look like Jesus. At my worst, though, I sound and look more like a Pharisee, to be honest with you. I have the ability to compare my best against your worst. (laughs) I have that ability to do it. Do you have that ability? It's a superpower, isn't it? You have the superpower of being able to say, at least I'm not like an insert name there. And when you do that, it's powerful and it's actually intoxicating because if I can point out your worst against my best, I can ignore all my worst because at least I'm not. And I never take stock. Friends, we're a mixed bag of contradictions. Now, maybe you're saying there, Jonathan, I'm not. Okay, well, let's, let's do a little test. We say we trust God and then we worry about our future. Which is it? We say we're people of faith And yet our decision-making is often fueled by fear. Which is it? We say that we're the people of peace, God's shalom to the world, and yet we all have areas of road rage inside of us. We say we're people of joy with anger issues, though. We say God is our provider, and we're so quick to bow at the altar of money. So quick to do that. Which is it? Listen, maybe, maybe you're like me. I am and maybe you are, a little bit like Herman Melville describes in his classic novel, Moby Dick, I am dreadfully cracked about the head and sadly in need of mending. (laughs) Does that describe you? Maybe you're having a tough day and this is easy to identify with. But, you know, I think Herman uh, Melville nailed the human condition. I think Shelley understood this and has helped me understand this over the years, that I and everyone I meet is dreadfully cracked about the head and sadly in need of mending. But the good news is Jesus knows that about us. Friends, think of the the most um, godly person you've ever known. It might be a parent, it might be a pastor, it might be someone in folklore you've read about, a missionary, someone that just was a great person of faith, and maybe you saw their gentleness, you saw their love, you saw their committed, uh, commitment to truth and declaring truth, and you saw all those good things about them, and then remember this about them, that they were all tortured, weary, restless souls that needed to drink from the same bucket of grace that you and I do. You and I do. We all do. In fact, I love the Apostle Paul because I think he's like the super Christian. I think like if you're talking about a Christian, he's a Christian on steroids. He said this of himself though. He said, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. To save sinners. And he says this, I'm proof. Public sinner number one. (laughs) He's throwing himself under the bus of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. Paul's saying, listen, if you know anything, if you've ever read about the Apostle Paul, he lived a really morally strong life. He kept the rules. He did what he had to do. And he's saying, listen, apart from sheer mercy, apart from sheer mercy, I would have never made it. I was public sinner number one. Do Do you feel like that? You're in good company. You're in good company. 
Every single one of us that you meet, whether it's in the church, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, or whether it's the person that greets you in the mirror every moment, every single one, every morning, every single one of us is a mixed bag of contradictions. Now, why is that important? Because if we're going to be authentic, we can't pose anymore. We can't pretend to be better than we are. We need to be real about where we are and who we are. Look, here's the truth. People are not attracted to your perfections. I think people admire perfections. People even kind of worship perfections, but they're not attracted to it. They don't want to get too close to it because all that does is remind them of where they're at. It's not their your attraction. People are attracted to your authenticity, your realness, your humanness. See, I think, I think actually people are more attracted to your imperfections than your perfections, aren't they? It's those things in my life that are being changed, that have changed, that people look at me, and that's what they're attracted to. Why? Because there's hope for them. I mean, if I've changed, then you can change, right? If you've dealt with your anger issues, then certainly I could deal with them too. If you found peace and joy in this life, why can't I find this in this life? Witnessing without making people cringe requires authenticity, being human, being real. This is a picture of a lighthouse in New Brunswick where I grew up, and this is called Swallowtail Lighthouse. It's my favorite lighthouse in New Brunswick. And many of you know, I'm a maritimer, and the maritimes are known for their coastal beauty and their down-home hospitality. But I've lived more years outside of the Maritimes than I ever lived in them. I've been away longer than I ever was there. And I noticed something over the years. Shelley and I have talked about it many times. When we would go home to the Maritimes, my family that I hadn't seen in a while, my friends from high school, others that we kind of came across either in the mall or in the streets or, you know, wherever we might be. Uh, Even pastors that I administered with when I was younger, in my early 20s, when I was living there, they all would start by feeling us out. Because we never lived there anymore. And you could tell they're trying to determine, does he think he's better than us now? I mean, he left the Maritimes, a small community, and went to Toronto. Does he think he's better than us? Is he still one of us? Does he still sound like us? And the truth is, I'm really different from the kid who left the Maritimes. You can't help but change when you experience new things and you're stretched and your capacity is stretched. Of course I was different. But at another level, I was always still a Maritimer. You can tell on weekends, I still sound like I'm from the Maritimes on occasion, don't I? Jump in the chat room and you can give an amen to that. But, but also too, you know, I'm not better than them. And the more I would be warm and just be myself, the more they went at ease and they felt like we're in this together. Friends, I hope, if you're a follower of Jesus, I hope you've changed. I hope you've been on this pathway of transformation that God's word and his spirit has been changing your value systems, your behaviors, your activities. Your, the cadence of your life has changed because Jesus and his spirit has been involved in transforming you. But, 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 I hope when you come across that old high school friend, when you talk to someone who, from back home, I hope you remember where you come from. I hope, to borrow a term from the Maritimes, you haven't grown too big for your britches, that you somehow think you're better than or different. Friends, in the middle of all of this, we need to remember authentically that we will always be imperfect until we see Jesus someday. And if God has done a transformational work in our life, it's sheer mercy, sheer mercy that we've been able to change. So here's my admonition to you as we talk about witnessing and not in a way that won't make people cringe. Be authentically you. Don't try to be someone else. Be you. Be your culture be your age, be your gender, be your experience, be you because that version of you is compelling and attractive. The second thing we need to remember is not just being authentic, but be active. 
Be active. I keep pushing the Gospels on you because there's something about reading about Jesus, his teaching, his values, his views, and his activities. Because Jesus' activities inform our activities. I want to behave like Jesus behaved. And my witness gets power through my actions. My words build weight through my activities. And Jesus' activities in his words were always lined up. So think about it this way. If Jesus had to pray, I think I have to pray, right? If Jesus was what made it a, a part of his life to come into the temple and worship, then you know, making these gathering moments are a priority in my life, not to just worship by myself, but with my community, the people I call my church family. If, if Jesus, and it wasn't just all of those spiritual disciplines that Jesus did that we are to uh, emulate and to uh, replicate in our own lives. I love, as some theologians, and I was reading some this week, I thought they were brilliant. They were just kind of highlighting the activities that made Jesus so attractive in this world. Have you ever noticed that he comforted the afflicted, but he afflicted the comfortable? Did you notice that about him? The comfortable people, the status quo, they, bo- they were bothered by Jesus. Those that were already bothered and hurting in this life, he comforted them like a healing bomb. Did you ever notice how kind he was to the shame-filled prostitute and how fierce he was to the self-filled Pharisee? Do you ever notice how he noticed and gave special attention to the poor and he had denounced people who ignored the poor? You see, if we want to be attractive like Jesus, we need to be active like Jesus. If we want to be attractive like Jesus, we need to be active like him in this world. James, the half-brother of Jesus, put it this way. He said, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I mean, isn't that obvious? That God talk without God actions, God acts, is outrageous nonsense. Uh, one of my sons uh, finished the master's last year, and I, it was funny, when people would ask him, uh, it would be the same question everyone would ask him about his studies. And I, I used to love to listen to him try to explain his major. They'd always ask, what's your major? What are you focused on? And I think sometimes a lot of our witness becomes cringeworthy or is non-existent because I think, I think some of us are in the wrong major. I think somewhere along the line, we kind of missed the major, our focus point. What are we to be about? Now, as a church, you probably know our major because we say it often. The major of One Church TO is to help people know God, love people, and impact the city. And that city is anywhere you're viewing from right now, whether it's a town, a hamlet, a village, or a city, we want you to be able to impact it, and we're committed to equipping you to do it. Now, what that means is, There's a lot of activities we're not going to do. We are just not going to do them unless they help you know God. You get deeper into God. And what's the evidence that you know God? You're going to be more loving to people. You cannot know God deeply and not love people well. They're connected. And if you love people, you can't help it. You're going to impact the city. You're going to impact your community. You're going to impact your neighbor. It's a trickle effect. So, so we know what our major is as a church. What's your major as a follower of Jesus? This past summer, Pastor Dan, and Pastor Austin, a bunch of us were working on our discipleship model here. And there's a sentence that kept echoing around in our conversation that we kind of adopt it as the framework for our whole discipleship process. We felt like this sentence says what our major should be as followers of Jesus. This should be your major if you're a follower of Jesus, and it should be mine. It's simply this, to actively learn to live like Jesus. Actively, not passively, not passively, but presently, actively learning, not just head knowledge, but head knowledge that gets down to our hearts that eventually moves to our hands. You can tell someone's beliefs by how they behave in this life. You can tell their beliefs by how they use their money in this life. You can tell their beliefs by how they use their time in this life. Our behaviors reveal our belief systems. So we want to actively learn to live like Jesus. Actively learn to live like Jesus. I, I think 
we need to pause and remember that. If your pursuit of a deeper life with Jesus, if your pursuit of a deeper understanding of Scripture and a deeper walk with God, if that pursuit is not leading you to love people and actively do what Jesus did as he walked this earth, then I think you might be in the wrong major. You might be in the wrong, you might be like the Pharisees. They were in the right program, the right area code, but they had the wrong major. This is why we launched Love Army as a church. Love Army wasn't a gimmick. It's not some sort of do-gooder program. It wasn't something that we could just mark up a bunch of acts of goodness in the city and somehow during COVID pat ourselves on the back. The motivation for Love Army came from a completely different quadrant. The motivation from Love Army was this. How do we help people in their everyday life actively live like Jesus? How do we help them copy the activities of Jesus by doing good wherever they go? Because I know this, and this is in my mind, for years I've taught I've taught discipleship classes, I've memorized scripture, I have, I've, I've equipped people, and I've realized I've taught a lot of people that never changed. Because unless it's incorporated into their habits, it becomes head knowledge. And that information doesn't transform them unless it gets into their hearts and into their hands. So Love Army is an extension of our discipleship thing because I know this, if you start behaving like Jesus just by getting the garbage for your elderly neighbor, just by getting a coffee for someone that might be in need, or or looking out for people around us during COVID-19, if you start acting like Jesus, you know what? That behavior turns into a belief, kind of reverse engineering. That gets deep in your heart and that transforms you. So if you call One Church TO your, your family, your church family, I want you to know that you're already a part of the Love Army. I'm not going to recruit you. I don't want to have to. I want to say this. This is something we're doing as a community. It will not only change you, it is changing us as a church. This is something like in the Bible when it talks about being in one accord. We're not in discord with some of us doing it and other people doing this and I don't like this. No, we're in one accord and we're trying to do this together, not just to accomplish impacting the city, but I'll tell you this, it's like every other kingdom activity. You think you're going to do the good and God does the good in you. You think you're the one that's going to change someone else's life and you inadvertently, you begin to change. See, this is beautiful how this works. So I want to, I want to encourage you, take out your phone. If you're not already, follow Love Army on Twitter, uh, um, Facebook, Instagram, where, wherever, whatever your social media channel is. Follow Love Army, and here's why. We, we send out a challenge every month, and it's a chance for us together as a community, no matter where you live, in this nation or around the world, You can be a part of the love army and you can begin to do good where you are. And friends, it'll change you. In the short while we've been doing love army, even my wife and I, it just changes the way we see people and we're on the hunt to be able to actively behave like Jesus. So be authentically, be authentic, be active. And then third, be invitational, be invitational. Now, the idea around this is simple, and this is very, really short. We're going to just close in prayer in just a minute. An invitation can be a really beautiful thing. You know, we all know what an invitation with strings attached feels like. You know, someone invites you, but they're really demanding you. <laughs> or someone invites you, but it's with a good truck full of guilt to make sure you come or whatever. That's not a real invitation. That's manipulation. To be attractive and not cringeworthy, we're not trying to manipulate anyone. We're being invitational. A beautiful invitation is open-handed. It's like inviting someone to a great meal. Sounds good, eh? Or you're inviting people to a great moment, like a wedding celebration or a baptism, some sort of great moment in someone's life, and it's a celebration. Or you're inviting someone into a great experience, like a night out with friends with laughter. Wouldn't that be... That's, we're looking forward to that sometime soon. And, and those are great moments we invite someone into. And if you notice Jesus and you study him, you realize that was his posture. He was always invitational. Even when he was teaching, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, I invite you to listen if you'll open your ears and open your heart and listen. And when he asked people to follow him, he didn't demand they follow him. 
He invited them. He's inviting them into a better life, a better way, a better truth. So friends, as followers of Jesus, we get to be invitational, not manipulation. We open-handedly are inviting people into a great meal, a better meal, a kingdom meal where they can taste and see that God is good. We're inviting people into a gr- the greatest moment, a moment where they have a chance to experience salvation and transformation. So all of a sudden, God's spirit is inside of them and they're able to change from the inside out instead of everything being from the outside in, which is totally difficult and hard to do and can't be done. It has to come from the inside out. And then we're inviting them into the greatest experience ever, Jesus. So I want to invite you to be invitational, to be authentic, to be active, and be invitational. Easter is coming up next week. Pastor Keith is going to conclude this series as a part of our Palm Sunday celebration. And then the weekend after is Easter, and we're calling it Shaken. And I want to encourage you to be inviting someone. Good Friday, Pastor Keith is going to be talking about how Jesus experienced this cosmic shakedown, the greatest miscarriage of justice ever. And we've been shaken over this last year. And the gift of being shaken is it reveals what you're trusting in. And we're going to have an opportunity on Good Friday to put our trust in the solid rock of Jesus that doesn't matter what comes, it stands. And then on Easter, Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to talk about how Jesus' death and resurrection shook the whole power base. All of a sudden, all of those powers that were in control were put upside down. And all of a sudden, it's the weak that excel in this new kingdom. And Jesus shook off those grave clothes so you and I could shake off the things that control us and bind us and damage us in this life. So friends, why not invite someone? In the chat room, you're going to see a little button there. If you press it, it'll take you to our Easter page. And there you can, you can download the image for Easter and send it, email it to a friend. You'll see a button for tweeting it or Facebook. Go ahead, invite someone to join you on our Easter weekend at One Church TO. Let's, let's be like Jesus, friends. Let, let's be authentic. Be very real. Let's be real, friends. Let's be active. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's do the Love Army stuff. Not just when the Love Army's prompting us. Let's get this into our behaviors in this life. And then let's be invitational. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this community. What a privilege for me to be a part of One Church Theo. Now, I love these people. We love each other. We see it in the chat room. We see such care for one another in the chat room. People praying for each other. People welcoming each other. It's a community, God. And someday, someday, God, we're going to be able to gather again. Physically. But until then, God, we are standing in the space and we're saying today that COVID can't stop Easter. And God, we know the truth of the gospel, even though we can't physically gather right now, the truth of the gospel has not and will not be limited by our ability to gather. Instead, God, we pray that this Easter through One Church TO and the community, the people you've placed in our lives, that we would see a seismic change as people. And I pray for God's people here just to be invitational and people's lives would be changed as they find Jesus and they discover all along Jesus has been searching for them. Father, I pray you bless your people. Make your face to shine upon them. And in this beautiful spring day, we'd walk out on mission. Authentic, active, invitational. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, we hope you join us at one of our campuses if you're in the GTA for a weekend gathering. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, we'd encourage you to join us at onechurch.to slash live. We believe everyone can be a part of what Jesus is doing both in our community and in our city. So if you'd like to connect with us at a deeper level, visit us at onechurch.to slash next steps. See you next time.